Shalom once more to bring you spiritual greetings from the hills of La Jolla. Today, as our modern world prepares to move into the last quarter of the 20th century, still struggling, still groping, still seeking answers to the wrong questions, it becomes highly imperative for each of us to keep blazing the torch of truth in our hearts and to walk silently, boldly in the path of light free from the babble of the world mind. Today we will add two new words to our spiritual way of life. Those words are soul energy. You may not know it, but from the very first day that you appeared on earth, you have been looking for soul energy. The human race has been seeking this mysterious energy since it first began to walk upright upon the earth never really knowing what it was seeking, and of course never really knowing where to look for it. Soul energy is the substance of transition. It is direct divine energy. It is the life-giving energy of the spiritual world. If you find it, the imperfections of your life dissolve like snowflakes. You're lifted out of time. You're lifted into the eternal now. You're lifted out of all dimensions into the one infinite self. And you're lifted out of lifespans into life that is truly eternal. Soul energy functions only under the government of God. Whoever finds it, finds the kingdom of God on earth. But if you fail to find it, as the world has failed around us, you linger with the rest of the world in the dualities of the flesh wavering between the good today and the evil tomorrow until for some even death seems to be very merciful. Soul energy has been unknown to the world for many, many reasons. But mostly because man has been unaware of mental energy. It has taken thousands of years to reach a state of mind, in fact only during the past hundred years, has science painfully become aware that all its concepts of matter were false. It has finally admitted to itself that matter is mental energy. And to that we might add a postscript which science has not yet added to itself. And that is that mental energy is negative energy. And science will discover that negative energy is the substance of our world. Now even though science has become aware that mental energy is the substance of matter, there is still a lingering and a very overwhelming material sense that seeks answers to all our human problems in material solutions. Better weapons, better technology, better human improvements. And as a result, the world, which is still very real to man, continues to be made of this cosmic mental energy, which is not the creation of God.
there's going to be a day when the knowledge that mental energy is truly that which flows from the cosmic mind, not from God, and that it comprises the flesh and blood that we see around us, the substance of a tree and a leaf, the substance of a flower, the substance of the hills and the valleys, the substance of nature, the substance of everything in the sky, on the land, and in the sea. And when that day comes, there will finally be an awakening, a desire. What shall we do about this mental energy? How do we get out of it? And man will discover then that all these thousands of years he has been trying to use mental energy to overcome mental energy. And it simply doesn't work. It will take this frame of mind, the seeking of a new method to overcome mental energy, which will open man's eyes. I think Isaiah was saying that in 42.16. He was speaking of the day when men are looking for at something, that miraculous substance beyond what they have just discovered is the false substance of the world. Then I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. Isaiah was hinting at soul energy. The eyes of man will be opened, and he will discover that only soul energy can lead him out of this mental wilderness. And then he will learn one of the most remarkable secrets of the Bible, that this transforming energy of heaven, this nectar of the gods that we are calling soul energy, is vibrant, radiant, flowing all around us right now. I mean, you can feel it. Try it. Just be still. It's here. It's always been here. It's just waiting, waiting. I make all things new. I am the way. Let the Lord build the house. These are words saying that soul energy is just knocking at the door of your consciousness saying, let me in, I transform, I quicken you. I change all that is not divine into that which is divine. This invisible Savior, this oil of heaven, we are walking in it unaware of it. Just think for a moment how many hundreds of times the Bible has told you about soul energy, but your ear was stopped up. You read but did not see. When Christ walks on water, when gold appears in a fish's mouth, when Christ disappears in a crowd, when a ship, sea, instantly appears on a shore, they're telling you about soul energy, the miracle of it, the substance that manifests only the divine activity, the divine law, the divine action, the divine will. Of course it looks like a miracle to us, because it's beyond the realm of our own mental energy. When the eyes of the blind are opened, that's soul energy. When invisible loaves and fishes materialize from above to feed multitudes, that's soul energy. You're witnessing divine form made of divine substance. 
You read about it in the Psalms. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. The psalmist is rhapsodizing about an esoteric oil. That's soul energy. In the 92nd Psalm again, My horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of an unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. He's speaking about soul energy. Now that is direct divine energy from the spiritual universe. And it requires no human intermediary. You knew, of course, that soul lived by some divine power. He refers to it himself. In the epistle here to the Hebrews, let's look at chapter 1, verse 9. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. He's writing this to his disciples. And therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Paul here is referring to the oil of gladness. He is telling us that he lived by soul energy and that some of his disciples had learned to live by soul energy. And of course that's what he meant, I live yet not I. Christ liveth my life. Remember in Bethany? the house of Simon the leper, Mary came, sister of Lazarus. Remember what she had? It was an alabaster box, and then it was a precious ointment, and she poured it on the head of Jesus while he was at the table. There was a point there, I know religion missed it very greatly. But the significance was that when you accept Christ in you, and we're going to have to elaborate on that, when you accept Christ in you, and we'll just let it go with that for the moment, then something happens, something miraculous happens. And that acceptance releases soul energy. It pours forth your cup runneth over. The event didn't stop there. It was elaborated on. It was important, you see. When the disciples were very indignant, they complained. They said, couldn't that ointment have been sold and given to the poor? What did Christ say? Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. And in Matthew 26, 13, Christ makes this illuminating prophecy. Verily, I say unto you, wheresoever the gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also be this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Must have been a very important event for him to predict that it will always be told about her. And I think the event is even doubly significant when you read about it in John's Gospel. And here, John tells us the disciple who complained the most bitterly was Judas. Oh, he was so bitter. The betrayer was bitter. Now, what is the significance there? Clearly, Spirit was using this particular way to dramatize something that you and I have to learn about very thoroughly. It was telling us about an invisible body of soul energy which was there as the invisible Christ and which is here in your room now as the invisible Christ. Judas then 
and I hope not to this now, material sense, in other words, betrays man. It blinds man to his own soul substance. There was Judas, material sense. All he could see was a material vase filled with a material oil. But there was Mary. And through her pure consciousness, she was seeing the undying essence of the soul. Both were looking at the same thing. Soul vision, mental vision. But what was there? The invisible, radiant, eternal body of soul energy, and so it is right where you are now. Many times, this deathless body of soul energy was hinted at. You find it in Elijah. Remember when he asked the widow, pour forth from your cruise of oil. And he did that before he resurrected her son. Then later, soul energy had done its miraculous work. And he carries the resurrected son from the loft down into the widow's house. And he says to her, thy son liveth. Later we hear the same words. And they're spoken by Christ Jesus to the nobleman. Go thy way, thy son liveth. Now in each case, the same speaker utters those words. Christ through Elijah, Christ through Jesus. You are learning that there is one omnipresent self. A moment ago, we mentioned... You must learn to accept your Christ self to release soul energy. Now you're learning there is one omnipresent self, and when you accept your Christ self, it is not enough to say, I accept that I am Christ. It must be, I accept that I am the omnipresent Christ. The distinction is vast, but is also vastly important. And we're going to have to elaborate on that still further. This one omnipresent identity, accepted by anyone, releases life-giving soul energy. The real substance of eternal life. Now let's remember, these events in the Bible are not there simply to bedazzle us with some supernatural miracles. They are really building a pattern of timeless truth, something we can trust, depend on, rest on the confidence, so that when we follow these events and find the principles in them and walk on those principles, the same soul energy can flow through us. In the kingdom of God that surrounds us, there is no energy crisis. Only in this world. In this world of mental energy. Right now, we may have a, an oil crisis until the Mexican thing is developed, but there will be a crisis after that. Every underground oil deposit which man desperately seeks today is a human concept about soul energy, atomic power. And corporations have invested billions in atomic power is another concept that we entertain about soul energy. These are cosmic concepts that man receives from the cosmic mind and accepts. Our exploration of energy continues in many, many places. We're looking for new sources. We read in solar, wind, geothermal power, vast deposits of kelp seaweed. And these two represent changing limited concepts about energy. And they are here because man has not found the real energy, 
the real source of life itself. There isn't a business conglomerate in the world that wouldn't gladly pay billions of dollars for the right to manufacture soul energy. But fortunately, an infinite intelligence has devised a very unique method for the distribution of this miraculous divine energy. You're never going to have to worry about human monopolies or about government rationing or controls. No nation is ever going to have to go to war to steal soul energy from their neighbors. You're never going to have to be concerned about radioactive fallout or environmental pollution. And perhaps best of all, there is no man on earth who can sell you soul energy, who can give you soul energy, or who can take it away from you. You get it direct. It is direct, it is divine, and it is bestowed as a gift, but only to the Son of God, who walks within every man. Son, all that I have is thine. That includes all of the energy of the spiritual universe and it is available right here where you stand and wherever you may go. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The psalmist is revealing the river of soul energy, the presence of it, the power of it, the availability of it here and now. The heathen raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. Soul energy and only soul energy melts the mental energy that encircles the globe with false images of good and evil, with false powers, with false disasters, with false death, with false destruction, with false images, and places before you in your midst, the glory of his perfect will made flesh. You have seen the miracle of soul energy. It is omnipotent. It dissolves any seeming power that besets you. It breaks the cosmic hypnosis of sense images which appear as the material powers of this world. Remember Hezekiah? He had this enlightened realization. And with it, he conquered overwhelming odds. He knew that the arm of flesh is only negative energy, mental energy. It's no match for positive soul energy released by a pure consciousness, a non-material consciousness. Every so-called power on this earth lack Limitation, disease, destruction, death is revealed as negative mental energy. Mirages of the mind. And Zechariah reminds us, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. Here again, spirit proclaims the omnipotence of soul energy. The direct expression of divine will, replacing your mental concept of dying matter with spiritual form, 
harmonious, protected, self-fulfilling, guided, governed, and sustained by one perfect, infinite consciousness. Man shall not live by bread alone, not by mental energy alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Here you have divine assurance that soul energy is available direct from source to you without a human intermediary. For I, I, says the Father, will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten. Soul energy restores what mental energy has taken away. And he shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and he shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. Israel. Christ consciousness. I am in the midst of Christ consciousness. And that I am the Lord your God and none else. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my earth, pour out my spirit upon all flesh, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Soul energy replacing mental energy. Soul flesh replacing the flesh and blood of mental energy. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, and it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now the name of the Lord is the omnipresent self. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, whoever shall I accept himself to be, that omnipresent self shall be delivered. Please hold on to that. It's going to mean so much. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said. And in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Here Isaiah tells us that the divine outpouring of soul energy is the magic matter that feeds the poor in spirit with the nectar of heaven. As your heart opens to this kingdom of God within you, earth yields its harvest to heaven. You are lifted out of the concept of flesh and blood, out of the false powers of evil, out of the limited powers of good, out of the cosmic hypnosis into your own pure being. You are begotten of the Father, reborn in the womb of Spirit, and you are revealed as the one omnipresent self. Your false mortality falls away. Behold, the Son of God, no longer a finite, dying human being, subject to cosmic mind, not a physical body, held captive by uncontrollable forces, but delivered, liberated, out of darkness, into light, by this flow of divine soul energy. Yes, physical science is groping for new energy sources, but it's fumbling for material solutions to these human problems. And it's completely unaware that there is no human brain power, man power, or money power that can produce a true answer to the really important questions that face mankind. No research laboratory will reveal soul energy. Billions in research projects will only continue to uncover the mirage of temporary material solutions. There is no amount of human dedication in the pursuit of scientific discoveries and inventions that can change the truth. And the truth is that every person on earth, including scientists, who believe that the hope of the world lies in the hands, including the churches who believe that if we suffer enough in this world, we'll be rewarded in the next one, including governments who believe that their survival depends on weakening their neighbors and expanding their own armaments and their own physical powers, including all human races who believe that human prayer, human fasting, or even human morality 
can in some magical manner bring forth an answer to their pleas for relief and survival. All must discover that the divine plan includes none of these human methods. Oh no, the divine plan is not to fulfill human needs, but to lift us above human needs. The human mind may be perfectly willing to compromise for good health, a guaranteed lifetime income, or a tank full of gas, even a fishing pole near a well-stocked stream. But that's not the divine plan. Nor is it the divine plan that we die, that we suffer, and that we lack. In fact, the divine plan is that we stop dying, stop suffering, stop lacking, and let our own soul energy express divine perfection right where we stand. Judas, of course, makes us say, now how can I improve my position in the physical world? How can I fulfill my human dreams, my hopes, my ambitions? And perhaps rising above this Judas level, we might ask, how can I help my neighbor, my community, my country, and the world I live in? But even this, we must remember, is still no higher than good humanhood. It limits God's will to human thoughts to human beliefs, and to human activities. The good human desire of Peter to help the epileptic was not enough, and so he failed. If the honest desire in our hearts to help our fellow man were all that is necessary to bring peace and prosperity on earth, the world would be enjoying peace and prosperity right now. Because the desire for mankind's happiness is alive in the hearts of millions of people around the globe. Why, there must be thousands, purely motivated persons who would even die, I guess, if it would help mankind achieve lasting happiness. There are many dedicated ministers who would gladly, willingly, happily lay down their lives to free mankind from poverty and disease and war. And right now, there must be many business and professional men and women who are making personal sacrifices and would make even greater sacrifices if in any way they could contribute more to the betterment of humanity. But unfortunately, all this human love, sacrifice, and dedication has proved to be no match for the false powers of the cosmic mind. Human failure has been due to one reason alone. Man does not know that real success is only possible when we release divine soul energy into our daily experience. That is the divine plan. Without soul energy, individually and collectively, we die. With soul energy, we live. It's really that simple. Without soul energy, we're really condemned to wonder. Blind creatures in a wilderness of the mind, finding false solutions to false problems. Frustrated, despairing, even watching our great human love fail to fulfill our highest and noblest expectations. But with soul energy, Divine blessings throw open the gates of heaven on earth. We walk with angels. We can bless the world. We can bless our neighbors. We can bless our enemies. We can bless the weak, the poor, the sick, the hungry. How? We bless them all by releasing the only living substance that can redeem mankind from the hypnosis of mental energy. And this is how each of us can and is expected to fulfill the divine plan. The big question, and probably the only question that we really have to solve, 
is this. How? How do we release soul energy? from the infinite source into the visible world. I'm certain that the inner self will help us find the answer as we are still. The light shineth in the darkness. In the midst of us, says John the Beloved, right where we entertain a physical sense of self, there is another you, a light, radiant soul energy, shining in the darkness, the substance of eternal life unseen by the human eye. The darkness comprehendeth it not. We are the darkness. Personal sense, material sense of self, living in a fleeting dream of time. This is the darkness. And this darkness this personal me, this human self put in a physical form, this is the darkness which is the obstacle to the flow of soul energy. The belief that I exist in a physical form, in a physical world, this is a stone that blocks the passage of pure divine light into my consciousness. My own mortality is darkness. Let's face it now. Right at the outset, John bluntly tells us that your heart, your brain, your physical body, your whole physical mental sense of human life is blocking the flow. It does not comprehend the light. Now one meaning of darkness is our blindness to the soul energy waiting to reveal the perfection and fullness of joy that constitutes our real, eternal life. But the second meaning of darkness is to alert us to the magic of transformation. Darkness is a negative condition. It's really the absence of light. But in the presence of light, the darkness disappears. And so here in soul language, John is telling us there is a divine plan for man. Just as the darkness is the absence of physical light, so your human selfhood is called darkness because it is the absence of divine light. And just as darkness vanishes in the light, so your human selfhood will be swallowed up in the divine light. And the light which you already are will shine forth as your self. Then the darkness will comprehend the light. This mystery of individual transformation is only fulfilled by the flow of soul energy. When the negative energy of the world mind is replaced by the positive soul energy of your omnipresent self,
your physical sense of selfhood falls away and you move freely in a new deathless body of light functioning under grace under perfect divine law beyond control of all material powers. There's a different meaning of illumination here. It's not a human being receiving inner inspiration. That's but a sign on the way. The only illumination acceptable unto the Lord is when the concept of humanhood dissolves, releasing the time image called body. And a higher faculty beyond mind declares within you, I am the light of God. When that light and you are one, the same one, the omnipresent one, you are illuminated. You are then the one light itself. And mortality vanishes into oblivion. There is a glorious fact to be understood now. Your true immortal body of light is present. Waiting to be lived in right now. And that is the deeper meaning of John's statement, the darkness comprehendeth it not. There was another one, fortunately, who had found the pure body of soul energy, which flows from the infinite source. That was Elijah. Having demonstrated that matter is a dream and material law has no power, he walked off the earth in that eternal body of light. But now, here comes Elijah again. And he reappears in a strange way as a virgin-born son of Elizabeth, the cousin of Mary. That's right. John the Baptist. Whenever one appears on earth who is born this way without a human father, you can be certain that this is an attained soul returned for a special mission. And John the Baptist was certainly on a special mission. It was a twofold mission. He was here to witness the one universal light where men were going to see only separated physical forms. And he was here to prepare mankind for its individual transformation of universal light into soul energy, into soul form, to replace physical form. And that's what's going on right now where you and I are concerned, and all over this world where there are those children of light who are discovering their own true identity. Spirit always prepares the way and always provides the witnesses. Take John the Beloved. How remarkably Spirit prepared him. He had to know that John the Baptist was the reincarnated Elijah. So he had to be present on the Mount of Transfiguration to see the body of light of Elijah as it appeared in the consciousness of Christ. And just to be sure that he wasn't imagining things, he had to hear this again from the lips of Christ Jesus. You find that in Matthew eleven fourteen. There, John is assured that the Baptist, and we are assured, that the Baptist indeed is the very same Elijah, returned in a new form to prepare the way for the light in man's reborn consciousness. And now comes a dramatic pronouncement, misconstrued by man and by the religions of the world. The reincarnated Elijah 
appearing as John the Baptist, points and says, There standeth one among you whom you know not. Oh yes, the world said he's looking straight at Jesus. He means Jesus. And it was natural for the church to assume that he was referring to Jesus, the person. And right there, in that false assumption, man lost the secret of soul energy. But John, the beloved disciple, was prepared and he wasn't caught asleep. It had been revealed to him that the Baptist was not identifying Jesus, the physical man, as the one who stands among us whom we know not, but that the Baptist was identifying the invisible light, the universal light, as the identity that stood among us that we knew not. And that's exactly why John began his gospel with the words, The light shineth in the darkness. You see, in advance, he was explaining that the one who stands among us isn't a physical person, whether it's Jesus or Buddha or Krishna or any 20th century Christ. The one who stands among us is the light, the one omnipresent self which the darkness called man must learn to recognize and accept as his own being. That's why we needed the son of a virgin to identify the son of a virgin. Light had to identify light. And then to John the Beloved came the responsibility to record this event for all men. That was only the beginning of a miracle. Now John the Baptist was coming to reveal another earth-shattering truth. And I think this is a divine secret so sublime that it just couldn't be accepted or understood at the time by the sleeping church. And so it has lain dormant in the Bible all these centuries while men have struggled and fought among themselves to possess false treasures of this world. Let you and I be awakened, and let the wisdom pour through us today as it poured through the Baptist on that eventful day, for the truth is no longer a closed book. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And then he added, Which taketh away the sin of the world. I want you to realize that this is not a statement by John the Baptist. These are divine instructions. Behold, the Lamb of the world is a divine instruction for mankind. If you tamper with these words, you pay a tragic price. If you distort them, oppose them, violate them, alter them, disobey them, or ignore them, you're setting yourself up as a higher authority than the Spirit of God. And so let's look at these divine instructions closely. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And now please ask yourself if these words mean, Behold, Jesus Christ, who will take away the sin of the world, when Jesus Christ returns again to earth. You see? How subtle, how easy it is for cosmic mind to pose as the authority of religion and to falsify the word of God. First, it misses the real me. And then it manufactures its own concept of the me. Then it adds a little sugar coating. And finally, mankind is off, running, chasing, after something it already possesses, but it's running in the wrong direction. It's yearning for a marvelous day when Jesus Christ will return to earth to banish evil, 
and to open the doorway to a promised future kingdom of God. And I say, this is a religious infidelity to the word of God. And for it, all mankind has been paying the ultimate price. Even people without religion and those who claim that God has no existence whatsoever are paying the ultimate price because they have been denied the opportunity to find the truth that religion has buried. The Lamb of God is the light of God in you and in every man on earth. When religion turns away from the Lamb of God in man and tells man to pray for the return of Jesus Christ, religion is committing the ultimate sin. It is turning away from the only God there is, the light in every man. It is denying the presence of that divine light in every man. And by this ignorance, it is sentencing every person on earth to die without finding God. Now we have received divine instructions. The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. This message of God cannot be altered one jot or one tittle to suit the convenience of any church or the doctrine of any religion. To do so is to court disaster. Divine intelligence has revealed the truth and no spiritual traveler can ignore it. I think we may sum it up with two statements. The gentleman up there, the abstract god of religion that man has been taught to worship, is a myth. It exists only in the cosmic mind. There has never been such a god because the only god there is, is the one omnipresent self, the one universal light that dwells among us. And two, this one universal self that dwells among us is your identity. It is the secret identity of every individual on earth, of everyone who has ever lived and will live, of every saint and every sin, of every man and every woman, of every race, color, and creed. Each and every one is the one universal self and when spirits point, points to the one known as Jesus, the son of Joseph, and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, it is telling us that all human form is mental illusion. It is pointing to a way show and saying, See that one? He is not physical. He is not human. He is beyond the powers of this world. And the reason is this. The Lamb of God is the infinite light expressing itself. His presence is showing all of us the nature of our own true being. And when you realize that the infinite light within you is the Lamb of God now, you will be free of cosmic hypnosis, which is the sin of the world. We must refuse to go along with a cosmic mind which ignores the universal light among us. The religions of the world are continuing in separation and they are serving the world mind. And you can see it all around you. The result is the confused, sometimes pathetic world in which we live. It's a masquerade. False worshipping of millions who are taught to honor man whose breath is in his nostrils instead of their own true identity in Christ. There's only one way to worship God, and that's to honor the light of God within you as your own substance, and as your only substance. If you remain flesh and blood, you're not a servant of spirit, but a servant of the cosmic mind. The sin of the world remains in you. When religion turns its back on the divine revelation that the reality of every man is the Lamb of God now, it distorted scripture 
and very grave for the human race. The reincarnated Elijah, witnessing that universal light, individualizing itself, which he called the Lamb of God, was pointing to the path of glory for all spiritual travelers, informing us that we are not human beings. We are not sons of darkness made of negative energy of the cosmos, but we are children of the one universal light. And that if we live now and act now in oneness with the universal light, accepting it as our omnipresent be, we will live under the perfect government of that light. Or, we can, if we wish, continue in the darkness of the mind, as mental shadows without real substance, separated from our own light, offsprings of the Father of lies. John the Beloved wanted us to know that we can make the choice. And for this reason, he focused attention on the light that shines in the darkness. Your light, the light that never dies, because it is the universal light manifesting itself. In this realization, you are blessed by soul energy, flowing like the gentle rain from heaven. In your meditation now, Release your concept of body. The child of light has no physical body. And release your concept of other bodies and of other material objects. until you find yourself free in a universe that is unobstructed where instead of air there is soul energy substance of life itself rest now peacefully in this invisible universe of soul energy. You have never really left it. It has always been here. This is the invisible universe of light, our true home, our true substance. This soul energy is omnipresent, it has no beginning in time, no end, no boundary. It is unlimited. It is always here, maintaining a perfect kingdom, always active, always available, always doing its perfect job, no matter what your mind sees in the eye. This soul energy is the Lamb of God. It is the sun. It is infinity flowing as the sun. This soul energy, which has no boundaries, is your infinite body. It is also called the Father within. It flows everywhere as the activity of the omnipresent self. Let it live itself as you. Know yourself as the omnipresent child of light. Know your substance 
as miraculous soul energy and do not accept the appearance of flesh and blood. Do not climb back into a physical form. Hold yourself in the knowledge that I am eternal soul energy. I have always been, I ever will be. Wherever the world may look, I am. In this acceptance, in this conscious knowledge, the quickening of the infinite transforms the outer shell. The invisible grace of heaven moves quietly in the midst of you manifesting the kingdom of God on earth where you stand. You are bathing in the pool of Siloam. on earth is performed by the cosmic mind using mental energy, negative energy. On the other hand, virgin birth uses soul energy, positive energy, and is performed within the infinite consciousness. In reverse, all human death is performed by the cosmic mind and is the termination of mental energy. Whereas soul energy makes transition instead of death. When the master within observes that the fowls of the air have no barns to store grain. He is revealing mystically that you do not have to store in barns either, that you are surrounded by invisible divine manna. He is alerting you to the omnipresence of soul energy, the secret of resurrection, while still in the flesh. Again, when the Master declares, My kingdom is not of this world, we are all being informed that another kingdom is here, made of this miraculous soul energy, which transmutes our human experience into the divine by dissolving material illusions of this world. 
the living substance of the kingdom of God manifesting on earth is soul energy. And the substance of the world we live in is dying mental energy. This entire illusion of human life is made of dying mental energy. All human flesh is made of dying mental energy. The physical earth, all its, contain, all its condition and all it contains, made of the same dying energy. So that's why material things deteriorate. That's why we have disease and destruction. That's why fire and flood can destroy. The substance of this world is not the atom or the subatom. It's cosmic mental energy. Cosmic thought converts its own concept of the real kingdom into this negative energy. And it's this negative energy that appears in image form as the substance, the inhabitants, the activities of the world in which we live. The world is literally in our mind. Each of us lives in our own mental universe of negative energy, controlled by the creator of it, which Christ described as the father of lies. And it's that false father from which all humanhood springs that is identified in the Bible as Satan, which of course means the cosmic mind. It's this cosmic mind spinning its web of mental energy that creates the mist, the false substance of our world. And in this dying mental energy, we're all actors. And we're playing roles that are written for us, not by God, but by this cosmic mind. And so generation follows generation into its grave. The entire parade of good and evil illusions continues as unknowingly we enact the cosmic will. Oh, we cling to these paper mache lifespans and we're so proud of our achievements in the physical illusion. We're living in the darkness of human vanity in an ego that God never created until finally the grim illusion fades into the nothingness that it really is. But the light shines in the darkness. There is a river. The kingdom of God of eternal life is within you. Seek ye first the kingdom of soul energy. And all things will be added unto you. Break the sleep of mental energy. The self you are ignoring is your own true self. Awake, release the imprisoned splendor of your own true being. Return to your own real substance. Reject this counterfeit. Step out, out of the darkness of mental energy, into the light of soul energy. How? How can we find this life-giving soul energy? this nectar of the gods, this magical transforming substance that flows freely through the spiritual universe? You have the remainder of this lifespan to answer that question. Not even a million words can answer that question successfully. The answer does not lie in words, nor in science, nor in religion. The only answer that will be successful is to lift your consciousness from where it is to that consciousness which knows it is the omnipresent self and lives in that omnipresent self without interruption. You have been prepared to do just that. Every word spoken by Christ through the prophets through Jesus, 
through the disciples and apostles, and through the modern apostles, is a tool to open your eyes to your omnipresent identity. But it is you, living, moving, having your being in and as the one omnipresent self, that determines which side is the veil you experience and express. It would be beneficial, perhaps, for us to backtrack a moment. I'd like to replay the identification of the Lamb of God by John the Baptist. using, as it were, two different cameras. One camera will represent what you and I see with normal human vision. And the other camera will represent what John the Baptist sees with soul vision. And let's see if we can discover why the world has so easily been fooled by what it reads in the Bible. Now, this will be a bit difficult. But really, there's no one but you and me who are prepared to do this. Seriously. It's going to be done by you and me, or it's not going to be done right now anywhere. So let's get on with it. For this particular teaching... We have to begin with the you that is not in a physical form. So at this moment, please, when you close your eyes, detach from the concept of form. Know yourself as omnipresent light. omnipresent self. Until you really feel free of form. When you are free of form, you may witness a very remarkable phenomenon. It begins somewhere in the cosmos, the world mind, like a cosmic computer. It pours forth cycles of cosmic energy which appear as the lifespans of objects in nature and its inhabitants. And then, somewhere, at some time, one of these forms made of mental energy bears your human name. You know it isn't you, because you are not in that form. You are the omnipresent light. But so amazingly deceptive is the power of cosmic energy to imitate real energy that all human forms of mental energy think of themselves as being alive, born, growing, living, and eventually dying. Now, if you could stay where you are, detached, free, 
instead of stepping into that body of mental energy, you would see what John the Baptist saw. You would not see a physical Jesus or a physical world. or even physical people. Everywhere you would see only the Lamb of God. And you would see Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. You would behold the real universe. And the radiant soul energy which is vibrating now and all the perfect divine images of soul energy around us. But now, leave this incorporeal spiritual universe and step back into the thought form that you have identified as your human body. We are back again in this world. And once more, we are automatically under cosmic hypnosis because the minute we stepped into this human thought form called body, we stepped into a cosmic system of mechanical negative energy. We became a captive in this control system. The cosmic mind sends ideas in the forms of mental energy and our own human mind automatically converts this mental energy into mental images which we call persons, places, things, actions, events. And always our human brain imagines that these mental images are physical and that they're outside. All right. Now, this was just our preparation. We're now ready to turn both our cameras on a very important biblical event to see why the world has ignored the great truth that was revealed on that memorable occasion. And so I ask you now to imagine that Jesus Christ has just walked into your room, right there where you are, Jesus Christ just walked in. There he is, you see him. But let's remember, you are in an advanced state of awareness. You're not just another human being. You can no longer have the privilege of saying, the physical Jesus just walked into my room in the flesh. You at least have to realize that everyone else in the room, including husband, wife, child, friends, they're all images in your mind. You know that. They're all made of mental energy. That's a fact. We've established that in the past weeks. And so that must be true if the omnipresence of spirit is true. There's no matter present. And because the mental pictures that cosmic mind presses into your mind about your loved ones do not fool you into denying their spiritual identity, you must now do the same. And so when Jesus Christ walks into your room now, you say, there can be no physical Jesus, there never was a physical Jesus, Jesus did not just walk into my room, Jesus just walked into my consciousness. And so I must be witnessing an image of Jesus Christ within myself. This would be the truth if Jesus actually appeared in your room. You would be witnessing an image of Jesus Christ within yourself. Is that fair? All right. And so let's establish this basic fact. Whether you are seeing President Ford or Jesus Christ, you are seeing an image within you. And if that is established as fact, you are ready now for the great revelation that is to follow. Now let's imagine 
that before Jesus Christ entered your room, sitting next to you was John the Baptist. And you and John the Baptist were both looking directly at Jesus as Jesus walked into your room. Now the question is, would you both see the same Jesus Christ? Think about that a moment. The answer is no. You would see an image in your mind. But John the Baptist would see an image in his soul. You would see your own mental energy. He would see his own soul energy. And if you were living in biblical times, at the time when Jesus was crucified and buried. The image in your mind made of mental energy would seem to disappear externally when Jesus was buried. Just as it disappeared externally for the disciples. But the image in the mind of John the Baptist would not have disappeared when Jesus was buried. He would still be seeing the soul image. You see, that's why we think our loved ones die. Mental energy forms the image of them in their minds and in our minds, but it's not God's substance. Then when the cosmic mind stops supporting the mental image, it disappears. We call it death. But John the Baptist was demonstrating a different kind of an image and a different kind of a substance which exists unknown to man. The Jesus Christ that he saw was not the same Jesus Christ that the disciples saw. The Christ he saw was not made of mental energy, was not mortal, was not subject to death was not subject to burial. And when he announced, Behold the Lamb of God, we were thinking of the image of Jesus seen in human minds. Naturally, we thought he was looking at that same Jesus. But the Baptist didn't see the Jesus image in our minds or in the minds of the disciples. He was looking at the image of divine light in his own soul. He was seeing a radiant form within, made of deathless soul energy, pouring from the universal self. And this offspring of the universal self, which is ever one with the self, he named the Lamb of God. Light was witnessing itself. Now please, carefully understand this. Spirit was teaching us that there are two images where we see only one. That means that there are two images where you stand. One image of you we see and one image of you we cannot see. If we could see beyond our mental concept of you, we would see your soul energy now, and we would discover an entirely different you. That's what John the Baptist was saying. Behold the Lamb of God. And you are doing the same with everyone that you see. You see, within your mind, you are looking at your mental image of a person. But if you could see within your soul, you would see a soul image of that person, which is entirely different. Both images are present, but you see only one. When you see the dying mental image of a person, you do not see the living soul image that is also present and eternal. But as your capacity is developed, 
to release your own soul energy, it will become your witness, as it did for John the Baptist. It will perceive beyond the mist of the mind into the spiritual universe around you. It will rebirth you of the spirit and make you what you already are, the Lamb of God. Soul energy will live itself as you, and mental duality will be removed. Like the rest of the world, the disciples only saw the world's concept of the crucifixion of Jesus. Because they were unable to witness the Lamb of God, the inner light, the soul energy body. They couldn't see within themselves. They could only see mental energy. They saw a physical, external man on a cross, which was their own mental energy. And it's very doubtful that they thought of him as a mental image in their own minds. It wasn't until much later, after the descent of the Holy Ghost, when their eyes were opened to soul vision, that they could behold the body of soul energy, which constitutes the real Christ, the Lamb of God, which is always present, which never was buried, and which, of course, has been mistaken by the world as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know the Lamb of God was never crucified. The light of God always existed. It could not be crucified. How could it be resurrected? And therefore, long before crucifixion appears to the mind of man, the light itself declares, I am the resurrection. Of all the disciples, only John recognized the Lamb of God before the crucifixion. John himself beheld the child of the one universal light, just as the Baptist had done. And he told it very subtly in the 20th chapter of his Gospel, first five verses, when he describes how Peter and himself ran to the grave where the body of Jesus had disappeared. Peter went in first. Do you know why John didn't go in first? The reason is so simple. He arrived first, but he didn't go in first. He knew what Peter didn't know. He knew that the true Christ body of soul energy has never been buried. That it is eternally alive. But he knew much more than that. John knew that he himself had an eternal body made of divine soul energy. And he knew it because he was living in it. He knew his own identity as the Lamb of God. And although very few people recognized it at the time or since, he was designated as the Lamb of God when Christ Jesus on the cross, looking at his mother, pointed to John and said, Woman, behold thy son, even on the cross. The invisible Christ was beholding only the body of soul energy, where the world saw a physical John, the disciple. And there you have one of the sublime blessings of the mission of Christ Jesus. Spirit beheld the immortal light of every man and woman on earth, revealed the presence of that immortal light with every healing and demonstrated for those who have eyes that one omnipresent light, one omnipresent self is now standing where all of us see the material images of this world. Your sacred function is to be that one omnipresent self. Please underline that word ten times in your mind. Omnipresent. You cannot be a Christ apart. You must be the omnipresent Christ, for there is only one. This alone is the path of glory. 
your fidelity to it automatically fulfills the two great commandments given to mankind. And so for the balance of the year, our work together is going to be pointed in this vital direction. And you have three specific assignments. Your first assignment, every day, without fail, Spend at least 15 minutes, more if you can, meditating on one subject. I am the omnipresent self. No formularized meditation. Keep it spontaneous and free-flowing. Let spirit feed you its words and thoughts. You have a second assignment. Every day, without fail, spend another 15 minutes or more meditating on the following subject. I am in heaven now. Why? Because the omnipresent self is in heaven now. And if you're not in heaven, you're not the omnipresent self. They go hand in hand. You can see that. And you have a third assignment. And this is just as important as the other two, maybe more so. Throughout your working day, stop denying that you are the omnipresent self. Maybe you don't realize that you're denying it. Maybe you don't know how you're denying it. We'll discuss that in a few moments. Now, we don't want you to fall into a pattern or a groove, so it's suggested that you alternate your meditations. For instance, tomorrow morning, uh, you might meditate on I am the omnipresent self. And later in the day, your meditation will be I am in heaven now. On the following day, reverse the sequence. In the morning, begin with, I am in heaven now. Follow later in the day with, I am the omnipresent self. These are your two daily meditations. And in addition, each day, you must learn how to stop denying that you are the omnipresent self. So let's begin right now with our first assignment. And let's keep it spontaneous. No pushing. Spirit will feed you whatever you are ready to receive. I am the omnipresent self. I would like you to stay with us for 15 minutes when you repeat it tomorrow and the next day, but there's no point of leaving 15 minutes of silence right on the tape. So, when you hear this on your tape again, after the silence begins, just push the button of the tape so that the tape stops revolving and you continue in your meditation. Meanwhile, now, we will go right into our next assignment. And I think in this second assignment, I'll do a little prodding, whereas in the first one I let you stay with the Spirit itself. Here, Spirit will function through both of us. Do you understand what I meant? Just turn the tape off before the silence terminates, and you continue in the meditation when you play the tape again. That will give you an opportunity to meditate for 15 minutes or more, and then if you wish to, you just turn the tape on and it continues, and it will lead you right up to the point where we are. Our second assignment is to meditate on I am in heaven now.
you will have completed a meditation on I am the omnipresent self. So it will naturally follow that I, the omnipresent self, and heaven are one and the same. Now, when you have accepted omnipresent self as yourself, day after day, for a few days, your meditation on I am in heaven now will be quite normal for you. Now, with your eyes closed, hold it in consciousness. Perhaps you're hearing street noises, or an airplane, or the siren of a police car. Maybe even you're hearing your own breathing, or someone in your room is coughing. Don't be fooled by that. Perhaps you have a cramp in your leg, pain in your arm. Maybe you heard some bad news today about a friend, or you're concerned about someone in your family. Well, don't be fooled by that either. This is heaven now. It must be. Because heaven is where God is. And the moment you forget that you are in heaven, here and now, in that moment you have forgotten that you are the omnipresent self. You have forgotten that God is here. And you have forgotten that where God is, heaven is. Now think about that a moment. Where God is, heaven is. How can you separate the two? Is God here? Then heaven must be here. Is this heaven? If not, then God is not here. Now, you see why man of earth lives without the power of God in his life? His five senses tell him he's living on earth. And that God is in heaven. And this automatically denies the presence of God and separates him from the God he seeks. See it clearly now. This is heaven, and God is here. Or, this is not heaven, and God is not here. If you do not make the choice, automatically, every day you will wake up and believe that you are on earth, and that is an automatic separation from God. Even to make the choice is not enough. You have to make the choice every day. And you have to remind yourself that this is heaven many times a day until this powerful truth takes root in your consciousness. This is heaven. Anything less is a denial of the presence of God. Now, science thinks this is the planet Earth. And that's why science cannot find God. The church thinks this is the planet Earth. And that's why religion cannot find the power of God. 
Mankind believes this is the planet Earth, and that's why mankind suffers sickness, disease, disaster, discord, destruction, and death. This is the fatal mistake of science, religion, and all mankind. And it will continue to be your fatal mistake until you take time daily to make the correction in your consciousness. You see? Heaven is actually another word for spirit. If heaven is not here, spirit is not here. And you have lost your spiritual universe. Now then, that is another of your great secrets. You've been given an invisible heaven to live in. And instead, you have let mental images fool you for most of your lifetime into thinking that you are living on a physical earth. You have lived unconscious of the living presence of God, separated from divine grace only by the flow of your own false material thought. You have walked in the shadow instead of in the light. That is only half of the meditation. And it's the easiest half. Now here's the second half of your meditation. Because this is heaven. Whatever cannot happen in heaven is not happening and must be a mirage of the human mind. All right, let's face it carefully. Do people die in heaven? Are there hospitals in heaven? Do people have heart attacks and indigestion in heaven? Are babies still born in heaven? Are women and children massacred by bombs in heaven? Which do you choose? Are you on holy ground, as Christ teaches, or on unholy ground, as your eyes tell you? Which do you choose? God or man? Heaven or earth? Invisible spirit or visible matter? Most persons have never been given an opportunity to make this choice. They just flow along mechanically with the tide, earthbound, glued to mortality, unaware of the invisible heaven that offers them life instead of death. Now you could continue with this meditation, and each time you do, vary it. Don't get into a formula and face the fact. First establish this is heaven and then because this is heaven, get rid of that which cannot happen in heaven because truth in consciousness releases soul energy. All right, we're coming to our third assignment. And this should become a way of life. The first two assignments were contemplative. And the third is truth and consciousness, daily to stop denying that you are the omnipresent self. And this is a very difficult assignment. It's also a rewarding assignment. In proportion to your success, soul energy will flow. Now let's review quickly. Christ means omnipresent self. Your omnipresent self is a light shining in the darkness. And this is the secret of all who have made transition. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And that means transition is attained by relinquishing your finite, mortal, temporary, physical self. And living now as the omnipresent self called the Lamb of God or the Son of God. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Believeth on the Son means he who lives as the omnipresent self expressing itself. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. 
And that wrath is the cosmic mind outfixing this dream life that eventually blows up like a balloon and disintegrates. The hour has come, and now is, when every true worshiper must live as the omnipresent self. For God is omnipresent spirit, and they that worship him must worship him as the omnipresent spirit of their own being. As man or as woman, you are darkness, division, duality. And even if you are good, you're only a good state of darkness, separated, temporary, finite. But the truth, which has been obscured by centuries of ignorance, is that you are not the darkness called human. You are truly the omnipresent light of God. And that means wherever God is, you are. Whatever God is, you are. And whatever else you thought you were, you are not. So face it. Unless you live consciously as the omnipresent self, you cannot know God aright, and soul energy cannot flow. So now let's turn to our third assignment and learn some of the cunning tricks that the tempter is using to make us be unfaithful to our omnipresent self. You can test your capacity to stand in truth just by answering some of the questions that follow. What in this world was created by God? Name one thing. If you can, find one single thing in this world made by God. You know more than God knows, and you have stopped the flow of soul energy. Only truth can make you free. Now, question two. Did God make a physical person? Your answer must be no. If God did not make a physical person, are you a physical person? Again, your answer must be no. If you are physical, you are calling God a liar. God says you are the omnipresent self, the Son, and no physical self can be omnipresent. Are you a human being? Again, you cannot be, because no human being is omnipresent. Do you have any physical problem? Well, if you have, you've been trapped into denying that you're the omnipresent self. Do you have a financial problem, a business problem, a domestic problem? If so... You're pushing your omnipresent self away, for it is the perfect divine self. Then what do you do about financial, business, and domestic problems? You recognize them as temptations, temptations of the world mind to make you deny that you are the omnipresent self. And your answer is this, yes, these problems are coming to my attention. But no power on earth can make me deny that I am the omnipresent self, the one perfect light of God. And so I'm standing in my true identity in the face of these appearances, confident that these appearances are false and powerless. Every problem is a temporary mirage made of false mental substance, not created by God. There are no exceptions. And while I rest in the knowledge of my true being as the omnipresent self, and here's the great secret, invisible soul energy will remove the mirage. Maybe it will require one day, maybe a week, maybe a month, and maybe I'll have to be faced with a parade of problems for a year. But I must remain faithful to my perfect omnipresent self. This world of concepts cannot intimidate us any longer. Concepts of matter and material conditions have power only over the mind that accepts them. More questions. If your life is mortal, are you the omnipresent self? Then which are you, mortal or immortal? And your answer must be, I am immortal. If your life is immortal, when did it begin? And your answer must be, the immortal life of omnipresent self has no beginning. It is eternal. It always was. It always will be, because my life is the eternal now. Question. What is present beside your life? Answer, I am omnipresent self. 
the only life. There is no life in the universe beside my life. Omnipresent life never dies. Death is the illusion of negative energy. Question. If you are omnipresent life, are your qualities living now? Answer. Yes. Peace is always present where war appears. Love is always present where hate appears. All perfect divine qualities of omnipresent self are always present and functioning, independent of the negative energy we entertain in the human mind. It should be understood that Christ is not a healing light, but a revealing light. Christ reveals the universe of soul energy radiant and vibrant all around us, obscured the human senses by the negative energy of the human mind. The perfect soul energy is as normal in the invisible spiritual universe as the concept of air is normal in the material world around us. In fact, air is our own limited concept about a divine life-maintaining quality which is contained within soul energy. At this moment, soul energy is all around us waiting to be accepted. When Christ says to the cripple, what did he do? He is actually saying, all that is here is living dynamic soul energy. All that is preventing you from enjoying this radiant life is your own false negative mental energy, which persuades you that you are entombed in a crippled physical body. You are not in that body. Pick up your concept, raise your consciousness, and walk in your real body of divine soul energy as the omnipresent self. That's your work from now to Christmas. I'll be working with you. These are my assignments too. And as we move toward this goal of soul energy realized, you will find moments when the excitement is more than you can bear, because much of it is out of the body experience. And this, of course, opens you to the undreamed of possibilities which somehow latently you knew always existed. I know that your fidelity will be rewarding beyond measure. And there is a growing conviction, particularly because of some of the recent correspondence and some of the telephone conversations. Well, someone said, let's say, we're so close to walking on the water. I suppose that's one way to say it. Another way might be that when will I realize that I already am walking on water? But this is one of the beautiful things of our work together, that all of us are experiencing different things. There's no one prototype or stereotype and that we all travel in the same groove. Some of the things I am told within, and some of the things you are told within, are so beautiful and so spiritually encouraging that I can truly feel the hand of guidance in our work. Your next uh, tape will come from the island of Catalina around Christmas time. 
will be leaving there for Catalina uh, within a few days. In fact, by the time this tape reaches you, um, Betty and I should be in Catalina for another adventure. And I'm quite sure that this indicates a further deepening of the work which we can all share. You are very precious in this work and never forget it. We are all holding hands, moving together in a beautiful adventure. Have a good turkey. We shall soon be talking again. Much love.